Before we jump into the incredible conversation I had with Itchy Boots and Ryan F9 in the summer at the ABR Festival, I wanted to invite you to come and join us at the festival in 2024. There'll be more bikes, more attractions, more facilities, more speakers, and most importantly, more good times. So, Head over to www.abrfestival.com to get your tickets today. And I'm looking forward to seeing you there. Enjoy the pod. Thank you very much, this is very kind. Hello, thank you and welcome everybody. Welcome to this very special recording of the ABR Garage, the podcast from Adventure Bike Rider, here live at ABR Festival 2023 in the Bridgestone Campfire stage. Thank you for joining us. So uh, I'm James, I'm the editor of Adventure Bike Rider magazine, uh, and I'm, well, delighted to be welcomed by two of the, well, not only the biggest stars of YouTube when it comes to motorcycling, but two of the biggest stars of motorcycling in the world, I'd say. We have Mr. Ryan F9. Hello. Thank you very much. And uh, we have Itchy Boots. So, uh, so Ryan, this is your second year in a row at the ABR Festival. Yes, it is. Uh, you came back. I Thank came back. you. Uh, uh, how are you finding it for a second year? I'm loving it. I've been looking forward to this ever since last year. Uh, there's not much like this uh, in Canada and the States, especially. Most of the, the motorcycle events are a lot smaller and, and really like all about the bikes, which is cool. But the festival experience here with the food and the beer and the parties and all the friends is is really unique. So for me, it's just a, a massive treat. I'm, I'm glad to be back. The course is harder. I'm going to say this year I ate shit this morning, so I'm, I'm maintaining that it's harder and, and telling everyone that it's harder. Is that the beginner route, the five kilometer beginner loop? Is that oh, it? yeah, it was the yeah. manufacturer, uh, you know, U-turn there. I just, uh, yeah, went into it uh, a little hot. Nice, nice. Uh, and Norley, this is your first year at the Adventure Bike Rider Festival. You've been here a couple of days now. How are you finding it? Yeah, it's amazing. It's so big and it's really, I find it so cool to see so many people together that all love the same thing. And it's awesome. Everyone loves the same bike. Everyone's a BMW fan. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's it. Nine. <laughs> Um, so you might have caught Ryan on uh talks throughout the weekend. I think there's some more happening as well. So instead of just repeating what you've been saying on other stages, we thought, as been as this is a, a recording of the ABR Garage podcast, um, we'd just chat bikes and travel in general. Does it sound okay? Sounds good easy. For me. Yeah, yeah, good stuff. It's the topic you know, specialist subjects. Um, and I've been doing a little bit of research. Uh, so... Am I right in thinking you both have science backgrounds? Yeah, so normally you used to be a geologist, is that right? Yes. In your former, former life? Yeah, I, I used to look at rocks and look for gold. Wow. <laughs> did you find any? I did. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't actually too bad. Yeah. Good. But this is more fun. So. Yeah. Uh, and Ryan, you know, you're the man who has put the sexy into motorcycle physics. <laughs> really. How you did it, I don't know, but it's sexy. I'm glad that you think so, James. Uh, <laughs> you may be singular in that opinion, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, studied physics in uni, and, and it's what I love to do, so I, uh, I just do it for, for my own entertainment, and uh, apologies for subjecting all of you to the same. Good stuff. So with that science background in mind, I thought we could title this talk The, the Science Behind the Perfect Motorcycle Journey. Um, I'm going to use the word science very loosely because I'm a writer and don't know any science, so pick me up on it if you can. Um, so we've got a series of topics that we thought we'd run through and get your guys' opinions, see if we can, we can form the perfect motorcycle trip. Uh, and please feel free to agree and disagree. I believe we can do Good it. Stuff. I'm confident. Good stuff. Okay, so first of all, let's talk about the motivation for a bike ride. You know, what, what motivates you... Norally, to, to jump on your bike in the morning um, and go and explore day after day. 
Yeah, I think I think we actually talked a little bit about this on the um, on the other presentation. For me, it's just one look at the bike, and I'm convinced. But just look at Emma. Yes. <laughs> So I don't need any more motivation, I think. One look is enough and I'm gone. That's it, just those two wheels gleaming in the garage or in a car park and you're off. That's it. Good so I do th that's why I do think you, you must ride a bike that like sparks you with joy. When you see it, you're like, <laughs> it's my bike. <laughs> Did you see my bike? That's the best and then you don't need any other motivation. Yeah, and was it, uh, was it the joy of simply riding a bike that kind of sparked you into starting your journeys? Was it four, five years ago on two wheels? Or, or was it kind of a, I, I don't know, a wanderlust to go and see various parts of the world? I mean, I, I started mo riding motorcycles really late. When I was 27, I got my license. And um, yeah, I th I th then I was just hooked. So it just went very, like, like a quick addiction. I suppose, yeah. Fantastic, fantastic. It hasn't gone away since. It's no, still, still no, as strong. No, it's only gone worse, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So Ryan, okay, motivation. We've got the bike. So to create the perfect, perfect motorcycle trick, well, we need a bike. I told you it'd be scientific. Um, what motivates you to, 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 to head off, whether it's for, I don't know, the commute to work, a weekend away, or, or a longer tour? Yeah, for me, it usually is just the commute. Um, I. My only vehicle is my bike, and uh, it's a fantastic thing to have the most fun part of your day be the first thing that you do, because it makes it easy to get up in the morning, makes it easy to go to work, because I wake up and I think, oh, great, whatever else happens today, the first thing I get to do is pop on my helmet and have a ride. It's usually like shortly after sunrise, and it's crisp and cool, and it's beautiful. And then you get the bookend on the other side of your day where like whatever shit went on, it doesn't matter anymore. You can put the helmet on, and, uh, and you're sort of covered. Am I allowed to swear on the ABR podcast? You, you can swear as much as you like. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. So even on, on, a, on a rainy day in, well, uh, Vancouver, it rains yeah, probably as much in Vancouver. In Vancouver. Yeah, They're all rainy. As much as it does here. You know, you're, you're still motivated to put on the gear, head off, and, and just follow that love of two wheels. Absolutely. I've always loved rain rides. They're kind of nautical um, in a way. It's, it's like, it's fun. It's raw. Like, you're right there in the elements, and it's something to be enjoyed. Yeah, and as, as two people who, well, you do bikes for a living, you know, you, you, you travel for a living. Does it ever get old? Never. What? Never for me either. It's, it's not a job in any sense of the word. <laughs> or at least I, I would never, I'd never want to work as a geologist anymore. Like now I've tasted like this, the ultimate thing. There is no way I'll ever go into the mine. Okay, unless it's to make a film. But On your travels, do you ever look at a rock and go, hmm? I do. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So I, <laughs> I, can't, I can't switch it off completely. Sure. But I just don't want to work for a mining company or like an exploration company anymore. But I, I'll keep my eyes open. <laughs> you never know. So you're saying that motorcycling is, is better than finding gold. Is, is it that much of a passion? It is, man. <laughs> man, that just rode itself. Oh, it? I know, that's poetic. That should be on a yeah, t shirt. Convenient, yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. Okay, so we've got our motivations. If we're going on a motorcycle journey, we need a destination. You know, do we, what do we go for? Do we go for desert pistes, mountain passes, remote wilderness, or, or do you love, you know, riding through bustling cities? You know, what, what are the best places to, to, to ride through, to journey through, Ryan? Oh, gosh, I was hoping you'd go to Norley first. She's been everywhere. Oh, you, you, you live in <laughs> Western Canada. It's beautiful. Go on. It is beautiful. Um, for me, we recently sh uh, shot a video down in Oregon in the dunes, um, and that was probably some of the coolest terrain I've ever ridden. If you're a skier or, or a snowboarder, it's just like powder skiing. Like, you, it's wide open, and you pick your line, and you carve more than ride straight because it's more stable in a corner um, than w when you're trying to hold a line. So for me, let's go wide open desert. Yeah, and I know we spoke last year about um, you discovered a quarry, didn't you, in Canada when you shot your Africa Twin video? Oh gosh, now yeah, that, that's that a bit of an, an unusual mine. destination. Yeah, yeah, it was uh, an asbestos mine, uh, which is not the best place to ride. Um, it's dedication to, your, to yeah, your career. They look amateur, fantastic. I know a geologist probably wouldn't do it. Um, we just saw these all these hills and they were like really weird, like moon gray. And then the ponds were like this crazy Gatorade blue. And we were like, oh, this will be great. This is gonna look so good on camera. So dive right into it. And then, uh, yeah, on the way out, we were like, did that say asbestos? Shit. Please you know? tell me you didn't touch the water, did you? Uh, no, no, we didn't touch the water, didn't drink it. Uh, and it had rained a little earlier, so it wasn't too dusty. 
Um, I don't know, no third arms yet, but that's about as scientific as we've got with the, the, the risk assessment on that. Yeah, let's let's not do that one on the scientifically. How is your health? Country. Is it okay? Are you, are you feeling generally good? pretty good? Yeah. Yeah. Good, so good. far, so good. Uh, no, nah. Don't ask, don't tell. Right? Just kind of like, feels fine in there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, Norley, you you've been to places that most of us only dream of. Um, uh, can you can you choose the perfect destination or your favored type of riding? For me, anywhere where there's no people. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose, sorry. <laughs> You're in the right place. <laughs> uh, how to make this ride? I, I, I hate riding in cities. No yeah. fun for me. And maybe because I'm Dutch and we do not have any mountains, then when there is a mountain, I'm like, oh, a mountain. So I love mountains. But when I can choose between mountains and wide open desert with, you know, we don't even have to follow a trail. You can go wherever you want. And that experience I had recently in Mauritania, which was for me the absolute ultimate, ultimate adventure riding, where you, you could go wherever you want. And ah, amazing. I love the desert. It's not for everyone, but I think deserts are just, yeah, the ultimate for adventure riding. Yeah. Did you ever come across areas that, you know, you're thinking, Oh my God! How can I do this? Can, oh, can yeah. I can I cross this place? I th that's most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I I think like the one ride, so I rode through the southern part of Morocco, Western. Sa well, you're not allowed to say Western Sahara. The southern part, and there was one day where I d had to ride 600 kilometers, and I knew there was it. It has the longest mine belt in the world. There's some problems there, so y there's landmines everywhere. And so I knew, okay, just as long as you stay on the existing tracks, you're okay. So there you can't go wherever you want, fair enough. So the whole day I'm staring at this track, like, don't go off the track, don't go off the track. And everything just kind of, when you focus too much, everything is everywhere. Where was I going with the story? What was the question? You were uh, riding across a minefield. <laughs> is there anywhere? <laughs> yeah. It's the fear, you know. Is, is there a lot of fear to overcome when you're in these pretty extreme right. places? Yes. Yeah, so there was. So I went on that thing, and I thought, no, it's going to be fine. It's going to be fine, and I was doing okay. And then at some point, I wanted to take a break, and I found a little tree, and I thought, oh, this would be a cool place to to fly up the drone. And I flew it up, and then I realized, I saw on the screen, that I was literally like the one dot in, in, in hundreds of kilometers of nothing. And that's when it kind of hit me, like, what am I doing? <laughs> like, why, what, yeah, like, why did I think this was a good idea? And then I was like, okay, okay, let's get the drone down. So I got the drone down, and I was like, just keep going, keep going. And I was just like, mm -hmm, just the whole time, like, yeah, just trying to make it, because that, okay, that freaks me out a little bit, yeah. yeah. And one of the things I really enjoy about your videos is the honesty that comes across. You know, there's not an ego here trying to hide the scary bits. Have you, are you ever tempted to sort of cut the bits where you're thinking, oh, shit, I can't do this? Or is it important to you to show everything? I, I mean, I don't think there's any hiding because you can hear my breathing, like... <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, yeah, there's no point in trying to hide anything. I think. The fear is sometimes there, yeah. Yeah. But it's good. It's a good fear. It's good to have fear. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Now, Ryan, I know you've explored a fair amount of Canada, haven't you? Whether it's been filming. You were based in Quebec. Am I right in thinking? Yes. Yeah, I was yeah. in Quebec. Um, in the east-ish side of Canada, is that? Yes, yeah. it's east-ish. There's east more east, but there's always more there's in so Canada. so much more. <laughs> um, yeah, so yeah, east coast. Uh, done the trip across and now lots of the west coast stuff. So That's seen, it. Seen a good chunk of it. If you could pick an area of Canada to go and explore for... I don't know, a week, a month, you know, where would it be? Where would you go and lose yourself? I think that the next thing for me is probably Tuk. You can ride all the way up to Tuk Tayak Tuk. Um, and, Sorry, what uh, was that? Tuk Tayak Tuk. It's well. the town that's kind of on the Arctic Ocean. Um, it might be one of the furthest north roads in the world, or, or, or maybe the one. Um, and uh, the, they just finished the summer road. So it used to be you could only get up there in the winter, the ice road. Um, and then the summer road's been done only within the last decade or so. Um, so it's become a big motorcycle trip. Lots of guys go up there and, and experience the north. I want to do it. It's a point of pride for a Canadian to like go and be on the tundra and think about polar bears and uh, and, and meet Inuk people. Uh, so that's that's probably the next thing for me. It's a long way up there. Um, Canada's as tall as it is wide. We just don't really live 
beyond like the, the, the bottom few kilometers. So uh, it's something to do for sure. Yeah, yeah, good stuff. So it seems to be that our destination is, is remote, away from people, maybe a yes. little dangerous, maybe a little fear factor involved and some polar bears, which sounds horrendous to me. Sorry Fantastic. To yeah, good stuff. <laughs> Okay, so when we're thinking about an adventure, the perfect adventure, not everyone um, can disappear off for years on end. Some people have a weekend away, week, two weeks off work. But uh, what do you reckon is, is enough time to really feel that sense of adventure when you, uh, when you head off? Ryan? Oh. oh, any amount of time is enough time. Um... I had a, a V-Strom when I was in Quebec, and Quebec is uh, where I lived, quite an urban place. And uh, near Montreal, there was one road you could go to where it was dirt uh, that was maybe 20 minutes out of the city. So that's where everyone ran, uh, went. The absolute furthest thing from adventure, you'd be there with like 100 other dudes on GSs, and uh, everything would be fine no matter what. Um, and, and I went there one day, and the V-Strom 1000, if any of you have one, it has a very long key. It's like an emasculatingly long key. It's, the thing is just massive. And, and when you put it in the, in the panniers, the locks don't work very well, and it kind of spirals. Um, and so uh, I was riding out there in this completely unadventurous location um, and rode up to the sand pit, kind of dicking around there, chilling, went back on the bike, go to start the thing, click, he breaks off. It's like, okay, the adventure just started. Um, so it, uh, it sneaks up on you, and, and it can happen in, within an hour or less. And that's an interesting point, because often when things go wrong, I think it's something that Ted Simon once said, the, the author of Jupiter's Travels. He says, it's when things go wrong that the adventure begins. Is that something you'd agree with? Or are you a, a planner? Would you like to plan everything in advance? No, I totally agree. And that's why I don't plan things super rigidly. I, I think of broad strokes. I want to go here. I want to see this. And then I leave space uh, in the plans. Because it's in that space where usually the adventurous stuff happens. You get lost or whatever. Nice, nice. Uh, and Norley, you've been on the road for years how long did it take you to kind of adjust to this is my everyday way of life? <laughs> Has it yet? Yeah, no, yeah, for, yeah. It, I suppose this is now the yeah the new normal. So my normal was kind of like pretty intense, I suppose most of the time. Um, but I, I wanted to say something else about when things go wrong. If it then becomes an adventure. Um, I do think when things go wrong, at least those will always be the most memorable moments and the best stories. And at the moment itself, when it goes wrong, oh man, you feel terrible, right? And you're like, oh no, like how do I solve this? And why did I get, why did I think this was a good idea? But then when, you know, somehow you'll find a solution and later, like those are the stories that you come here to tell. So when something goes wrong, it's not always a bad thing. Got any examples of when things have oh, when not quite followed to plan, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> you've, other than minefields? Oh man, uh, the whole West Africa trip that I'm doing now, almost pretty much every day, I'll break something, I'll lose something, something, something goes wrong. It's been like a lot of stuff, and I haven't, I haven't shared all of the mishaps because I was getting so tired of everything that went wrong, and I'm like, I don't want to have to say again that I did broke this or like, uh. but yeah, it's um, you're just kind of troubleshooting all the time. But I think that's a part of it. I've, everyone has that. I don't, I haven't met any long distance traveler where nothing ever went wrong. Like everything breaks. I think it's normal, right? It's definitely normal. <laughs> Do you have, uh, have you ever had camera troubles on your trips? Oh, yeah, all the time as well. Yeah. I sometimes I kind of manage to salvage it, but my la latest video, I didn't plug in my microphone properly and I lost half a day of shooting. Yeah. That had terrible audio and I tried to salvage a little bit, but then half of it was just gone and you can't take, an, you don't take a second take, you know? So it's only like the next day or when you look at the footage, you're like, Oh, no, and then the whole story is gone, and nobody understands it. And it's ter yeah, it's yeah. We we <laughs> once left an entire video in a Dairy Queen. Um, <laughs> on, on, yeah, it's the card case, and it was just gone. And none of us had the hearts to do it again. Like the script was there, and everything was there. And we were just like, "There's no way. I'm not. I'm not doing that whole shoot again." <laughs> yeah, I'm never doing a second take. It's either there or it's not. Yeah. but you can't do you can't do it again. That's weird, right? I'm not going to turn around right again. It, you don't do that. So it's either there or it's not. Hopefully he's there. I, I'm just intrigued by this like long lost Fortnite video 
somewhere in, in a Dairy Queen staff member's computer or laptop or something like that. What was it about? Oh, I'll never tell. No, it was... Uh... <laughs> There's actually a few long lost Fortnite videos. We did um, we did a, a video a few years back. Have any of you guys seen The Room? It's like a terrible um, Tommy Wiseau movie. Um, so it's this really bad movie if you don't know it. Everything about it is bad. It's it's uh, oddly high production, but um, the acting is weird and the scripting is bizarre. And so we thought, oh, it'd be great to make a video, a Fortnite video, where the theme is bad video. Um, so we, uh, we tried to make a whole video uh, where it was sort of terrible but also fun um, and in the end it was like wow this is just terrible we can't release this um, it was we succeeded to the extent where it was just just awful so that one got buried uh, how many we maybe have four four or five in the vault that just just never never got released for, for a very rainy day maybe oh there there's <laughs> never gonna be a day rainy enough no we keep them to just like share with each other and be like remember when that happened and we're like oh yeah and then yeah that's that's the end of that uh, and it's interesting because you spend a lot of your time shooting, whether it's bike reviews, explanations about various things. Uh, we're talking about length of journey, but interesting to find out how long does it take you to to sh write, shoot, edit what are incredibly polished, kind of very professional YouTube videos? It's very kind, yeah. Uh, and the polished praise should all go to Luke because he shoots and edits our stuff and, 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 and is amazing, which is why I was so amazed at your masterclass because you do it all yourself. and I can't fathom doing that. Um, to answer your question, I think uh, the research is the heavier part for me. I always tell people I, I'm, I'm, I love writing, but I like writing more. Like I was a writer first, and so the research um, and, and the scripting is is where I really, really groove. So that'll often be like maybe five to ten days, depending on how big the story is. Uh, shoots are usually two to four, depending on uh, on what we need. And then we'll be in the edit for, for another five to ten, maybe. Um, again, depends graphic work and, and things that slow it down. One of my favorite things, and, and hopefully you guys as well, about Fortnite videos is I just never have a clue what's coming next. Like, it's always a surprise. You know, there's cheese, for God's sake. <laughs> yeah, you weren't expecting the cheese. Where, where was the cheese coming from? Come on. Oh, gosh, did I get you? So uh, is April Fool's a thing here? Yes. Yeah, okay. yeah. yeah, so, okay, it was April 1st. Uh, we wanted to do something that was uh, completely unrelated to motorcycles, uh, and all of us are, are big food guys. So we were like, great, let's make a video all about cheese. Gives us an excuse to eat cheese and drink wine at 10 in the morning. Uh, so it was a fun shoot. Yeah, but I think it's kind of the, the joy of Fortnite videos is I would never sit down and watch a video about cheese. How many of you guys sat and watched a video about cheese? There's quite a few. Like, when Hell would you yeah. ever do that? Yo, I should host a cheese party later for the select few. Man, you did the voodoo on everybody. But um, yeah, it's, it's, it, it's incredible stuff. But uh, where do the ideas come from? You know, is it, is it purely you just musing about, I quite fancy writing something about this? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's funny that you say you don't know where, where the videos are going because we often don't either. It, it's really uh, case by case, what are we bored of? So if we shoot a, you know, an adventure bike thing, that'll be great. And we'll be stuck in that project for three weeks. And at the end of it, we'll be like, I don't want to look at an adventure bike. And... So then we might do something on a helmet, and when we're tired of that, we might do something on a riding technique. So we're really just chasing our own interest. Um, it's it's the most fantastic gig in the world, and, and we all feel very lucky to do it um, because we just get to go around doing uh, whatever precisely it is that we love and we want to do. Um, and if other people enjoy it, then then that's a great bonus. Good stuff. Uh, and and Norley, your videos are very much uh, documentaries about about your travels. Do you ever start the day? and think, I'm going to shoot a video about this, uh, or I'm in this mood, so it's going to be this kind of theme, or do you just take it as it comes and see what happens? I, I do a lot of research on what are interesting places to, to go, or where could I... The rocks as well. Yes. <laughs> or where, where could I ride? So if I know, okay, there's this place, and then I, I try to prepare something so I can sound like I know what I'm talking about but obviously for me it's also the first place that I'm there and I have to kind of play tour guide at the same time whereas I'm seeing it for the first time as well but for the rest I have no idea what's going to happen during the day so it's always a yeah, surprise for me too and I'm always hoping that a lot of weird stuff will happen because then I don't have to worry about you know filling up 20 minutes and I'll just yeah put switch on the cameras and it will just it, the video yeah, will, will be there so what you're saying yeah. is that it's all scripted ahead of time and you have a secret camera crew and they follow <laughs> you around the world and uh, it's all the big ruse. I think I saw a video about that on YouTube, actually. Is it looked quite trustworthy. I spent my entire previous presentation trying to explain how 
You didn't. You were there. You said you were there. Yes, I know. I'm ribbing you. Come on. This is. <laughs> <laughs> I caught it. Yeah. Good stuff. And uh, getting vaguely or loosely back to the topic, we're talking about length of journeys. Um, uh, how long do you have to be off the road before you're craving to be back riding your bike? You know, are you, do you ever stop for two, three days, or a week in a place? If, kind of only if I have to. So I obviously have to stop for editing or sorting out a visa or trying to get a motorcycle part or something like that. But Or when I'm like really tired, but I just want to go every day. If I wouldn't have to do all the, the work, <laughs> then I would just go every day. But yeah, I have to obviously stop to produce the videos. But um. and I'm always fascinated to, to talk to people who talk into their helmets very, very well. Because I know here at ABR, when we do videos, some of it's scripted, some of it's off the cuff. I know a lot of your stuff, Ryan, is, is scripted, isn't it? You're, uh, you love your writing. Everything. I'm yeah. terribly awkward in real life. Well, that's, uh, uh, well, <laughs> yes, yes, you are. But, um, but I, I, I have to admit, I really enjoy doing the scripted stuff we do. I, I really struggle with just talking off the cuff. Like, I feel like a complete moron talking into my helmet on my own. Like, is that just something that came naturally to you? Is that something you had to kind of work on? I, don't, I mean, the good thing, like, I do my own editing. So whenever I say <laughs> something really weird, I'll just edit it out. <laughs> it's easy. Unless it's gold. And then <laughs> no, maybe. I say weird stuff all the time. But yeah. you don't know that because I edit it out. So. going to be an outtakes <laughs> video maybe one day. <laughs> all right. So we've come to no conclusion at all about how long a journey should be. No. Nope. If, if we're on the topic of helmets, how do you mic your helmet? I was curious about this. Super glue. Okay, but uh, what recorder? What? What? Like you record through the com, or you record through a? No, a I don't have. A, I don't have a com. So oh, okay. I, I have a, a super glue, uh, a microphone just here. Yeah. That's why. Also, just that's why sometimes you hear my breathing really loud. Sure. People told me I need to exercise more because I'm <laughs> half. But I'm like, you have no. You know how close the microphone is? Literally here. So you know. Um, and then uh, I have it plugged into my GoPro. Yeah, uh, uh, okay. a bit of media mod. Straight to GoPro. Yeah. Cool. It's good to know. It sounds great. Oh, thanks. Does it take you a lot of time each day to, to kind of set up your equipment, or is it all just ready to press a button and go? Ah, uh, yeah. It, I don't know, maybe 10 minutes. Oh, is that it? Yeah, wow. I've, I've done it so many times. I have a routine. It's like, pop, 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 go. <laughs> it's a great sound effect. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, know, no, Ryan, one thing that, um, and we will move on to the topics in a moment, but one thing that really impressed me was uh, when I met you last year, you said that it is just you and one other person making the Fortnite videos, which, which blows my mind, to be honest with you, because of the quality of them. Like, how, how do you go about that? I, don't get too technical and geary, but like, w what gear do you take to, to create something that, of that quality? Yes, what you say is historically true. Um, we've always been, uh, myself and uh, a cameraman who also edits, uh, within the last year, though, we added another guy, a uh, new host, and, and so we added another cameraman with him. So we're four now, um, which uh, which makes the team a little bigger. To, to get onto a, a equipment, gosh, I mean, the biggest thing is to hire a genius who who knows exactly what he's doing and, and can make you look cool all the time. Um, so thank you, Luke. Um, Equipment-wise, I mean, we shoot on pretty small cameras where... Uh, Oh gosh, was it Sony FX threes? So that they're little mirrorless things. Um, better to spend more money on the glass because because um, that looks really good. And filters um, tend to make things look uh, look pretty cinematic. Um, also, when you have a small camera, you don't get kicked out of places a lot. Um, when we have things on the gimbal, everyone's always like, "What are you doing here? Where's your permit?" Um, Vancouver's a big film city. They call it Hollywood North, and so uh, you can get permits to film places, and it costs roughly twenty to fifty thousand uh, dollars, which is not quite in the YouTube budget. So. Um, we tend to tend to go small and, and run and gun as much as we can. GoPros, 360. You have a 360, I believe. Yeah. 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 Insta? Yes. Yeah. I've, I had a GoPro Max before, and I have the Insta 360. But Insta is better, I think. Yeah, definitely. We yeah. nuked our GoPro. Uh, it's a GoPro 180 now. It's, it's one of the... Um, <laughs> One of the screens is completely gone. But it's nice to have a sacrificial camera. If we're ever doing something where it's like, eh, this will probably go wrong, we stick on the old GoPro 180. <laughs> GoPro's gonna hate me for doing this. Branded <laughs> GoPro 180, GoPro 180. I can GoPro is not sponsoring. I can say whatever I want about. Yeah, no, I no spend me. so much money on Go. I've oh man, the amount of money I spend on GoPro 
It's unreal. It's thousands, thousands of dollars. Oh, know, really? Sort of, yeah. Do you kill them a lot? No, but I, I upgrade all the time. So I started with one Hero 7. Then I got for, I think, Season 2, I had two or three Hero 7s. Then I went to buy two Hero 8s. One broke, another one. Then So uh, I have a whole collection. Because they do break all the time as well. They're terrible. Although the one, the latest one... <laughs> Don't think yeah, they're sponsoring the bro. festival, are they? No. <laughs> no. Sorry. Um, I mean, they're also, I mean, I'm still using them. I just, I haven't found anything that's better, so, but uh, I have, I'm the 11 now, I think, the latest one. Yeah. It's, and it's, it's, a new it's one been the best one so far, so I haven't yeah. broken one of those yet, so it's actually... Yes, yes. Yeah. But the 360, I really like the 360 because the battery lasts forever. You can capture everything. Nobody knows. I'm using it a lot for the secret filming because nobody realizes that it's on. So that's great, but the amount of extra work it is for editing it is, oh, it's terrible. It's so much extra work, but sometimes it's worth it because, yeah, it's... It good stuff, good stuff. Okay, well, moving on, uh, this is the Adventure Bike Rider Festival, so let's talk about bikes. Yes, sir. We're oh, heading yeah. off. It's the science behind the perfect road trip. Do we go big adventure bike do we go lightweight trail bike you know what is what is the ideal bike for an adventure norley what do you reckon i think if there would be one ideal bike for everyone then we would all be riding the same bike here so it, it's different for everyone and um, i think you just you know if you want to ride alone then i suggest taking one that you can lift up like that you can put back up a few times in a row if it's too heavy, then don't go on your own, I think. Or, but if you always ride with the friends, then I, I don't know. Whatever, what I said before, like just a bike that sparks you with joy and that you can lift up. But for the rest, yeah. And you've had a, a bit of a collection, haven't you? So uh, Royal Enfield yeah. Himalayan, <laughs> the CRF 300L and Rally, am I right in thinking? What do I have? Uh, the CRF 300. The rally, yeah. The rally, and yeah. is it the CRF 250L as well? Yeah, yeah, that, but that one lives in the motorcycle museum in South Africa. Oh, cool. Yeah, I'm How still owner, but it lives there. It's quite nice. Yeah. Yeah. Did yeah. they approach you about putting it in there? Yeah, they did. Yeah, but, but that bike, it, it's kind of like it lost the whole back of the bike because I did the rally and then I came back with half a motorcycle. <laughs> so, I, yeah. It's fine. <laughs> it still runs, I think. It's just very short seat. <laughs> nice. Uh, and of those bikes that you've ridden in various incredible places, you know, which is the one that fills you with the most joy? Which which is the one you would choose now to head off somewhere fun? Um, the, for me, the, the the one that I'm riding now, the Rally, has been, for me, the best one so far. Or uh, the one that I've liked the best. But I, I mean, I barely ride other bikes. So today I rode a T7, or yesterday for the first time a T7, and today I rode a Desert X for the first time. So I, I just, I can't really compare because I, I don't ride any, like I don't really ride a lot of motorbikes. But when I was riding the Desert X, I was like, oh, <laughs> very nice. It's a bit heavy, so, but it's really fun. So yeah, I, yeah, love that one too. Did you find out if you could pick it up? I didn't. I didn't. I rode it on the mud, and I didn't fall. <laughs> <laughs> so when it comes to an adventure, would you, would you say you're very much in the lightweight adventure camp? Kind of less is more. Uh, not really. I mean, <laughs> it's just because I like it because I know I'll be able to pick it up again and again and again because I do fall. Don't worry. Uh, but uh, so I'm not saying like everybody should ride a light bike. But I think if you, it's fun. Like, I, I just want to say, you don't need a big, expensive bike. Like, you can have just as more of much fun or even more on a smaller, lighter bike. Right. Yeah. That's it. And you're sat next to the man who's just bought a Desert X. Is that right? Did you? No. <laughs> no, no. I, uh, I, I, I pledged allegiance to a piece of pizza and a picture of Casey Stoner in a video. Um, and uh, and uh, didn't buy a Desert X. My boss bought a Desert X, um, and, and we did sell the 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 F eight hundred GS company bike. Um, the sentiment is very, is very much what it was in the video. We we think it's probably the best fifty fifty adventure bike out there. Um, if you're really concerned with slaying some corners on pavement um, and, and crushing it off road, for myself personally though, I'm I'm more of a small bike guy as well. Um, Halex three hundred be perfect. 
Yeah. And I, one of my favorite videos of yours was a review of a Harley Davidson. I'm not sure which one. Overnight. <laughs> Oh, yeah. uh, was Low it Lowrider S? Low yeah. yeah, an incredible video. Like, how do you find jumping into something like that, which is, I don't know, just a, a different world of motorcycling, isn't it? Yeah, it's an incredible bike. Um, it's it's incredibly well crafted. It's a ton of fun to ride. Um, you can sit the thing on its pegs in in every corner, which is a blast. Um, yeah, I, I love bouncing around. If if I wasn't in this job and, and had a million dollars, I would own a hundred different motorcycles anyway. So, so getting to do it with work and just go ride a Harley and go ride an adventure bike and go ride a trials bike. And it's fantastic. Sidecars. My goodness. Tons of fun. Have you been out on the sidecars of the festival? Not here. No. no? Is someone doing test rides? Yeah, yeah, you can go. I think you can go for a ride. Oh, okay. I'm not hundred percent sure. Seat. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Which looks incredible fun. Yes. Yeah, it is actually. It's it's a blast. Yeah. Good stuff. Excellent. Okay. So we looks at the bike. We're thinking probably more lightweight bike if we're going going adventuring in exotic places, but you know, just burning around the city that Harley was pretty fun. Absolutely. Yeah. Um so we touched on it slightly, but equipment. What sort of what equipment would we take on our dream adventure? Um you know, not really, what is it that you use on your uh, CRF? I'm all for soft, you mean luggage system? Yes, or? yeah, so luggage to begin with, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm all for soft luggage. I started with hard panniers in season one, and I've changed in season two to soft, and I will not look back, like I prefer it. It's lighter, it's more nimble, it sticks better to the bike, it's, well, in my opinion, I, I love it. It also looks cool. <laughs> <laughs> Um, How are you at packing, though? Are you uh, an organized packer? Because like, sometimes with soft luggage, you need to be a little bit more organized in, in how you pack the bike. Uh, I, I don't know. I have such a routine, and that's I, everything is all. Maybe I'm a little bit autistic in that sense, but everything's always in the same place. So it really takes me no time to pack. I'm like, pop, pop. oh, I think I'm going to pop, pop, pop. <laughs> There's a little pop, 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 yeah. Um, easy. That's it. And, and when it comes to finding your way, um, whether it's the Western Sahara, whether it's India, or wherever, how, how do you go about? Do you use a GPS? Do you use good old fashioned maps or a combination? Yeah, I can't do without GPS. Well, I have a paper map with me, but it's more to kind of show, okay, this is where I am. And um, I've had three different Garmin's. And, okay, maybe I shouldn't trash another. <laughs> it's entirely it. up we to you. Don't have Garmin anything. <laughs> uh, so uh, in this season, this is the first time I'm using a tablet, and uh, I've had a lot of people ask me which one it is, and I haven't said anything yet because I was worried. It was the first time I tried it, and it's not very cheap, and I thought if it's terrible, I don't, you know, if people think I'm going to buy it because, you know, it's good, and then if it's terrible, then I would feel bad. <laughs> but now I've been testing it for, oh, since February, and uh, it's, it's good. I love it, and it's just a... But it is an Android, so I just use OSM and. And uh, yeah, that I think I'll keep with this one. Yeah. Sounds good. Do I need to say more? Ryan. <laughs> Very cool. Ryan, I know you're, you're not the biggest fan of metal boxes on a bike, are you? No, I'm, I'm with Norley. I'm, I'm a soft luggage guy. I think the biggest thing is that when there's nothing in them, you strap them smaller so your bike gets skinny again and you can get through trees and stuff. Um, and also because I fall so often on the mud, um, you really can't break a soft bag. Like you can drop your bike on them a thousand times and it'll yeah. be fine. Whereas I've, I've cracked a couple hard cases. Um, there's some tough ones out there that'll kind of act as crash bars, to keep your bike off the ground. So, you know, no hate for hard cases, they have their place, but uh, I'm a soft luggage guy. And also packing cubes is, is the answer to your question. They're about sensational, yes. aren't they? Oh, fantastic. Yeah, packing. love them. We're so nerdy. Yeah. We really are, pack packing, getting all excited packing about yeah. packing cubes. Yes. I agree. I also use packing cube. Yeah, they're the best. <laughs> oh, are you okay? Uh, so you said you, you have the odd tumble. Have you, ever, um, have you ever crashed a bike and had to halt filming because it's just beyond carrying on? Ask the question again. Have you ever crashed filming? Have you, yeah, crashed while you're filming. Oh, have you ever crashed time. a bike uh, yeah. that you, you can't carry on? You've got to hike back however 100 miles to get back to Vancouver to get it fixed? There's a good question. No, I don't think we've ever destroyed a bike filming where it's been so bad that we can't ride at home. Um, we also have a pretty extensive toolkit in our, our film truck. Um, so that helps because we, we can fix a lot on the road. Um, but yeah, crashing filming all the time. 
Yeah, we released a video, I think, a couple weeks ago where I peached it pretty spectacularly. Good stuff. And it's talking about like repairs. How mechanically handy are you? Are you the man to go to if uh, you break a lever or, uh, or you get a, a puncture? Okay, lever and a puncture, yes. Um, I can do that, but otherwise, uh, I'm definitely not a mechanic. We made a video, gosh, maybe four years ago where we took a KLR to bits and then put it all back together. And that was completely just because I wanted to do it because I wanted to learn how all that stuff worked and, and know how to do it. So we made that video and everyone was like, wow, you know mechanics. I was like, oh, gosh, no, I don't. I, I did this to learn, you know? Um, so, so yeah, not a mechanic. And, and normally, you know, you're in a lot of places where I guess uh, a breakdown service isn't, <laughs> isn't within a phone call. Uh, do you do a lot of repairs on the road or have you just been lucky not to have too many? No, I, I'm not nowhere near a mechanic uh, either. And I just always hope for the best. <laughs> I, <laughs> although I have been super, is there wood anything anywhere wood? Because I must touch it. Okay, right. I haven't had a puncture in 50,000 kilometers. No. <laughs> Whoa. Uh, I know. Someone's looking out for you. <laughs> I do also think that's partly because of my tire management. Okay, also lucky, of course, because if you have a, a screw or whatever, then, you know. But I never ride the tires until they're like finished, finished, finished. Because, well, I can't because I never know where I'm going to find the tire again. So I have to change them always earlier when I can find a tire that fits. You know, if it fits, it sits. I put it on and, you know, if, it, if I'm lucky, it has, you know, it's knobbly. But uh, I do think that helps, right? If you still have, like, decent amount of rubber, then helps less, massively. Pun less punctures. What tire pressures do you run? <laughs> do you know why I You're never like say pretty this? Pretty firm, is it? No, I never say this because you know on the internet I, I'm obviously doing it wrong. Yeah, so of course. Yeah. Uh, I just you know, hard or soft. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> I don't well, have an answer to that. Do you? I don't actually. Also on this West Africa, I've maybe one time even lowered the tire pressure. No, wait, no, 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 no. In Mauritania. But I haven't been doing it a lot. I've just been riding with full tire pressure most of the time. Yeah. It, I just got lazy, you know. Yeah. Because I was like, the theory I've been kind of like mulling over, because I'm the same, like I pretty much never air down, and I also yeah. have uh, never had a puncture off-roading uh, yeah. on my own bike. Yeah, I've seen lots of people have others, but for whatever reason, not myself. Yeah. but I try to ride with the highest tire pressure possible off-road. This helps yeah. a lot. Yeah. yeah. There we go. Good stuff. Okay, so moving on uh, to the, the final talking point in our quest for the perfect motorcycle journey, which I don't think is going to come to fruition. Um, but the two people who, who make a career out of very successful YouTube channels, you're off on your dream adventure. Would you film that adventure? Norally, would you, would you film I am it? on my dream adventure. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good answer. I don't get, I don't get the question. And she is filming it. She has yes. a YouTube channel. <laughs> <laughs> Love you. <laughs> do you ever do you ever get tired of that daily routine though of of filming, editing, and that whole thing, or is it just just what motivates you to keep going? Um. Okay. If I'm really honest, I mean, there has been a few days that I've just been really exhausted. Like sometimes it's just really long days or I don't know, I'm really tired. But then I feel like I can't really say or look too tired because then I'll get people saying that I look so tired, you know? Like you've lost your spark. <laughs> <laughs> God. <laughs> so I have to be like, <laughs> pump myself up to be like, yeah, that can be a bit exhausting sometimes. Do you feel quite a lot of pressure to, yeah, to appeal like, you are well, obviously you do enjoy yourself. You love what you yeah. do, but is there a lot of pressure on you to, to, to basically you know push that all the time? I guess a little bit, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry, yourself, yeah. and Ryan, I know you hate what you do. <laughs> <It's> the worst. <laughs> That's it. Um, you know, when you're off riding for, for for pleasure, other than work, not that work isn't pleasurable. Um, you know, do you still do you get a kick out of writing and filming? For yourself, or is that just very much for work? No, never. Yeah, um, I when I go on my own trips, there's like not a camera in sight, um, and I, I'm quite uh, quite religious about that. Um, I have a lot of respect for people who who bring their work into their personal lives, 
um, because it's a balance that I think can be really hard to strike. But um, for myself, uh, I'm filming a Fortnite video. That's fantastic. I'll, I'll be all into it. Um, when I'm on my own time, no social media, no cameras, uh, no nothing. I just want to live it. Yeah. Are you always kind of thinking about what video is next? What kind of coming up with ideas, plans? Yeah, yeah, uh, always. I mean, the, the, the ideas kind of come from people all over the place. Like talking to people, uh, all you lovely people for the last couple of days, I've, I've probably jotted down like three, four uh, videos that, that will be made at some point. Um, so thank you guys very much for doing my job for me. <laughs> and give us a little sneak peek of, of what you might have planned coming next. Um, yeah, in the next little while we have, um, oh, what did we do? So we've got a, a video on, on the police motorcycle course, um, which is uh, job number one when I get back to Canada is, is to film the remainder of that. Um, we got a review coming up with the ZX4 RR, um, which is shot but not edited. Um, gosh, what else? Yeah, there's, there's more in the pipeline that's escaping my mind. We're always sort of somewhere in production on maybe four or five videos. Um, some way in the research stage or just the ideation stage and some, you know, nearly done um, or done and not released. But, but there's always four or five somewhere on the go. Uh, so you work on a number kind of simultaneously. It's not do one, finish, start another. I, I work on one, only one at a time. I like to be wholly focused on, on the one project. Um, but I'll have... You know, while I'm writing this video, I'll kind of have an idea that I've set aside for the next one. Um, and, and Luke will be already in the edit on, on the one we shot the previous week. And then there will be one sitting in the back end of YouTube that's just not released yet. So, so yeah, I, I'm on, on, on just the one job, but we have four kind of spread out elsewhere. Oh, good stuff. Uh, and Norley, what can we expect to see next released on your YouTube channel? So many troubles. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Is there a big backlog? Uh, let me put it this way. I'm being towed by a, a tiny motorcycle because my bike is not doing anything anymore. No? Sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it, it all went a little bit um, pear-shaped very quickly. <laughs> yeah. say Hondas are reliable, right? Sorry? They say Hondas are supposed to be reliable, though. Yeah, well, it's not. Oh. <laughs> I, <laughs> that's trash and other brands. Right? It's right there, too. <laughs> I see the flags. Come on. I mean, yeah, but, I, okay, so I have put, like, over 50,000 kilometers on a single cylinder, like, small little 300cc engine, and I've given it a fair amount of abuse, so, uh, I don't know, I think it's normal. Yeah, it's a hard right? life, for sure. <laughs> yeah, it's good, it's good. Um, as suspected, I don't think we've come up with a perfect road trip. But, you know, that's not necessarily a bad thing because I think adventure is, is whatever it means to you. It's whatever you make it, whether you've got a weekend free or, or you disappear off around the world and do incredible things. So um, I think that's fair enough to say. Um, but what would be great is if we could take a few questions from you guys, uh, anything you'd like to ask Ryan or Norley. And we've got Anna somewhere. Here she is, Anna, uh, with a microphone. So if you've got any questions, please raise your hand uh, and she will wander over. As a chap. Oh, there we go, right at the front. Mm -hmm. Is that on? Are we turned on? No. Which just... button should have a red light on it? Uh, might be on now. Um, Norley, um, how many languages do you speak is the first question. And what emergency equipment do you have when you're in the middle of nowhere? Uh, I speak, well, I had seven languages at school, in high school. But unfortunately, not all of them stuck. So my French is absolutely terrible, which is a shame because in West Africa, it's a lot of uh, French, uh, and I'm really not good. But um, yeah, I, I do speak a few languages. And um, I, th I think the only real emergency equipment I have is a Garmin InReach, which I used uh, in Mauritania for the first time, which was very, very helpful. and. Uh, I had it. With, I've had it for for a while, but this is the first season where I actually carry it like really within reach, <laughs> which was probably what it was intended for. <laughs> but um, and and in Mauritania, when I knew, I obviously knew I had to cross the Sahara, and I brought an uh, emergency bivy bag with me, which also came in handy because I slept one night in the sand next to my bike because it didn't start. And um, yeah, so the, but those are the only. Thanks. Excellent. Does anyone else have a question? Yeah. 
<laughs> Hi. What happened to the bike you had to abandon at the beginning of the pandemic? It's in the Netherlands. It took me six months, but I got it back to the Netherlands. But it's dead. Completely kaput. It died. No more. Yeah. No, it was a Royal Enfield. <laughs> <laughs> I can break a lot of things. No, that wasn't my fault. No. No, we'll leave it at that. We'll leave it at that. <laughs> uh, anyone else with another question? There's a... So... Uh, uh, like, all work aside and everything else, for the question for the pair of you, if, if you had to commit yourself to, like, one bike, not adventure, any bike you could possibly, you know, anything on two wheels, what would you pick? No, I thought that might be... But, like, for the rest of your life, the one bike? <laughs> Sidestep that <laughs> one. Ooh, uh, KLX 300. Yeah. How did you come up with that so fast? I like it a lot. Right. Fair point. Um, well, go on. Then my CRF 300 rally. If it rides. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Please do raise your hands if you've got questions. Anna, there's a chap in a black t-shirt right in the middle there that's really keen. Uh, this is Norley again. Um, after all these years of watching your videos, I've never heard you actually swear. Can you Until say today. Oh, Go on, Norley. <laughs> you want me to shout something at you? <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't be the first. Did it just get weird? What was the question? <laughs> <laughs> swear. It's a statement. No, you don't know. Swear. Make a swear word. We've never heard you curse or even get no, upset. No, you anyone. don't have to do anything you don't want to do. <laughs> what was the question then? Um, do you cut swearing out of your videos? Ah. No, not a lot, actually. No. I do just sometimes like the. <sighs> or like, oh no! But. <laughs> That's very crass. Yeah. No, really, I don't really cut it out. Excellent. Uh, please do raise your hands. We've got time for quite a few questions. So, uh, there we go. So, this is for Norley again. Um, what's Aww. the one bit of kit that you wouldn't travel without? The one thing? The one thing you wouldn't travel without. My camera. <laughs> um... I guess my navigation then, oh, I don't know. I can't think of anything cool. My bike! My bike! <laughs> yeah. Well, interesting, because you did do a lot of travel before you found motorbiking, didn't you? Was it yeah. did you, a fair amount of backpacking, was that it? Yeah, yeah, I've, I've, I've been traveling since I was 23. Like, since I, when I graduated for my master's, the next week I left, and I pretty much didn't come back. And now, next week, I'm turning 36. So it's been almost 13 years of almost constant travel. And it's only the last four and a half years that it's on a motorcycle and that I'm documenting it. But um, I'm almost reaching 100 countries, actually. I have this Ooh. app. Yeah. Sorry, I'm bragging now. Yeah. Woo! <laughs> I don't know why I said that. But, yeah. So it's... it's I, I, I've always been a traveler and later realized how cool motorcycling is. But I will always be a traveller. I just can't stay in one place. Do you know which country will be number 100? I think it's still three countries. I think I'm now in like 97. So it will be an African country. Yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. Good stuff. Yeah. Uh, any more questions? I've lost it. Oh, there she is, over on the right. Hey, um, what's the place you would never go back to and ride? And what's the place that if someone could just put you straight there, you would be there in a heartbeat to both of you? Oof, never go back. Turkmenistan? That was a really bizarre country. That was so weird. Um, yeah, it's a very strange country. To go back to, probably any country with the Andes. So Chile, Argentina... Bolivia, like the Andes, for me, the best mountain range in the world is the Andes. It is so spectacular. 
that, yeah, I would like to go again. What was it about being in the Andes that, that really did it for you? Oh, the geology is pretty cool. <laughs> the rocks. <laughs> the world's best rocks are found in the Andes. <laughs> I mean, uh, the, the, the mound, the colors, of the, the geology, the colors, the remoteness, nobody's there, tiny little border crossings with people that are so happy to see you. Um, it, it's just mind-blowing, really. Mm. Ryan, please don't say the UK. Or never go back. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no. Um, gosh. Oddly enough, it might be the, kind of the same place for both. So when we were shooting down um, in the Oregon Dunes, we went down with Luke and our film kit, um, and uh, the border guards pulled us aside and said, mm, this looks like a lot of stuff. This looks very official. And we said, no, no, we're just two guys, and we have this little YouTube channel. I'm not sure about that. Um, so they uh, decided that we had uh, too much production value and that we qualified um, under their union protections, which meant that we had to pay some prohibitively expensive things to go uh, film in the States. So unfortunately, it looks like we're never going to be filming in the States again. Um, but uh, if I could go back and film in one spot, it, that's probably where it would be. Um, there's great chunks of California where the riding's beautiful. Um, the dunes in Oregon are fantastic. And uh, it's been on my mind ever since because it's just unobtainium now. And is that seriously that you you might not be able to no, work it's, it's in the US serious. again? No, it's quite Like, I can go to the States. We've been put on some kind of... Uh, some kind of list. So you're on a watch I, list. I, yeah, every, <laughs> yeah, every time I travel the states, even if it's just you know myself and my wife and and whatever, um, we get pulled aside and they search all our stuff and want to know if we're going to film anything. And um, it's gotten uh, it's gotten really aggressive really quick. Sounds so, like they're harassing you. No, yeah. I mean I, it's it's their country, it's their prerogative. But uh, but for us, it looks like it might be impossibly hard um, to film in the states anymore. I wanted to bring this up on the podcast just in case there's like a U.S. Customs and Border Protection person listening who's like, oh, I could solve that. Um, that, that would be fantastic because uh, we want to film in your beautiful country. Um, but, uh, but it may not, may not happen. It's Brian at Fault 9. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yes, yeah. If you want to get me, my email is exactly what you would think it is. <laughs> Good stuff. Uh, please, anyone. Oh, behind you, Anna, I think. Uh, thanks. Question for both. Um, what's the most important non-motorcycling skill on a long tour? Mm. Ooh. Um, We've touched on languages, haven't we? Mm. I'd say just the ability Patience. to relax. Yeah, stay calm. Patience. Like, like dealing with like red, like a lot of like formalities and red tape, and it's just a lot of patience, I would say. And I think also just accepting that things go wrong. I think many people try to avoid everything, you know, from happening, which you can't. So it's better to just accept probably half of the time it's not going to go according to plan and just deal with it as it comes. Right? Are there any parts of the world where you've kind of struggled particularly with border crossings or, or conversely, are there any countries that have been super easy? Uh, West Africa is an absolute breeze if you have a Carnada Passage. Uh, it's so nice. Oh, I can recommend it to anyone. Um, Central America and South America is poor. It's a bit of a pain. Good and rocks, bad Asia borders. Asia as well. Sorry? They've got good rocks, but bad borders. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, anyone else? Please raise your hand. Hi, Norley. Um I was just wondering, like, when you choose your accommodation, um, do you ever find that you've gone in and just really not wanted to stay there because um, it's been either disgusting or the people have freaked you out or anything like that? Yeah, it doesn't happen to... Uh, it happened in one of my more recent videos I was in, still in Guinea, and I'm pretty sure it was a brothel, actually. When I <laughs> think about it later, I was like... Something felt off, and I looked at the room, and the sheets were so dirty. I was just like, I can't, I can't. So, yeah, it happens. But it doesn't happen. Usually, I'll just, I don't even ask to see the room. Usually, I'll just like, give me a room, please, and I'll just take whatever. I'm just usually just too tired <laughs> anyway. So, yeah. Ryan, have you ever found yourself with Luke in a brothel? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Inadvertently, of course. No. Your wife's not here today, is she? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, not today. 
Um, yeah, uh, no, easy question. <laughs> uh, and when you when you do film, uh, do you you know Canada's such a, a big country that I'm assuming you must have to stay overnight in in when you are filming. Do you, is, there, is there a big YouTube budget behind it, or is uh, is it camping in a spot that's away from some bears? Um, yeah, it's a bit of both. Uh, we camp when uh, when we have to. Camping is very much a means to an end for us. Like if we want to be there for that sunrise on the mountain peak, or if we're just going somewhere where there aren't accommodations, then we're tenting it. Um, if there's a cheap motel around and we can have showers and power, then, then we have showers and power. Um, so, uh, yeah, it, it's a bit of both, but I mean, similar, any cheap motel is fine. I'm usually tired enough to just crash. Do you guys always get on? Do you ever argue? Cause that must be quite a close relationship if you, you live and work together a lot of the time. Well, we don't actually live together. Even on nice. the road. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, no, actually you know, we get on tremendously well. Um, it's, it's surprisingly unheated we're just just buds uh both getting to do what we love so so chilled i like it i like it good stuff uh i've lost anna where is she there she is uh question question for ryan um my man yeah. come on <laughs> <laughs> now you know the, the video where you tried to kill a klr Yes. Where you sank it and everything. Yes, sir. Do you reckon Norley could break it? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I think we have to try. I think we got to get her on a KLR and see see what kind of damage she okay. can do, right? I'd like to see that video. That uh, would be good. Are you in Canada anytime soon? Are you in Canada anytime soon? Will we see that video? Oh, we'll just have to make. Oh, I'm here, so. Oh, gosh, yeah, we can find one in the next few I days. I can hop right? on, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, uh, we've got time for one more question. Ah, oh, perfect. <clears throat> Norley, do you have a TT cap? <laughs> and if not, would you like to swap with mine? <laughs> <laughs> it might have to explain what the TT is. Are you good? Oh. What? <laughs> We're all good. <laughs> you don't, the TT? No, but you want my cap? Yes. But I'll swap with you. <laughs> but, but that's the only one I have. Oh. <laughs> all right. Photograph of your cap with you in it will do fine. Thank okay. you. Sorry. Okay. On that note, um, <laughs> guys, thank you so much for joining us on stage. Uh, it, it's been brilliant talking to you well throughout the festival and it's been great hearing about your adventures um and i'd like to say a huge thank you to everyone here as well you know thank you for joining us at the adventure bike rider festival it, it's you that make it um so please do enjoy it the rest of your time you guys are going to be knocking around as well so um have a brilliant rest of your festival